just a quick note about today's webinar before we get started. This material is relevant for the MySeq research use only instrument and applications. It's not designed or relevant to the system, instrument, software, and or applications for the MySeq DX instrument. For anything on or relating to the MySeq DX, please refer to this link provided. So we have two primary objectives for today's webinar. First is that by the end of today's presentation, we hope to have provided you with an overview of the best practices when running the MySeq system and the basics of troubleshooting which can be performed on the system. Our second objective will be to empower MySeq users to use basic troubleshooting to further empower yourself in assessing unexpected instrument situations and implementing solutions to those situations. Let's quickly cover the agenda for today's presentation. We're going to start with some general information before proceeding to run best practices and common troubleshooting. Before we can jump into the best practices portion of today's uh, presentation, we wanted to cover some basics of the MySeq system and want to ensure we have a solid understanding of the system hardware itself. This will include a review of the MySeq system various flow cell types which can be ran on the MySeq, the sequencing specifications for the various configurations, some of the common MySeq applications, and lastly, a quick review of the MySeq control software versions which you may be running or encounter. Let's start with some key features of the MySeq instrument. A is going to show the flow cell compartment, which contains the flow cell stage, which houses the flow cell throughout the run. Flow cell stage motors will move the stage in and out of the enclosed optical module and return the flow cell to the stage, or excuse me, return the stage when the run begins. B shows the enclosed optical compartment, which contains the optical components, which will enable imaging of the flow cell. C is our status bar. Green indicates the flow cell is ready to sequence. Blue is that the flow cell is processing, or orange is that the run needs attention. D is the touch screen monitor, which displays the software interface for the control software and run setup. It's also the monitor for the instrument computer. E shows the external USB ports on the right side of the instrument, which can help facilitate the transfer of files and data to and from the instrument computer. F shows the reagent cartridge compartment, which contains our reagents at the proper temperatures during the run. Some additional features I wanted to mention are that the MySeq uses preloaded single use reagent cartridges. It contains cluster generation, SBS, and paired end or PE reagents. Each kit contains RFID based reagents and flow cell tracking. The instrument will perform onboard cluster generation and paired end fluidics, so we don't have to manually perform these steps or intervene. And the MICE can perform onboard secondary analysis as well. In this slide, we can see the three types of flow cells which can be ran on the MICE system inside their buffer storage tubes. A yellow cap corresponds to the nano flow cell type, which is the lowest yield configuration. A clear cap corresponds to the standard flow cell. And lastly, the green cap will correspond to the micro flow cell type. The differences between the nano, micro, and standard will become more apparent in the next slide in terms of yield, but just know this has to do with the actual imaging area on the flow cell. Nano has the smallest area and only images the top surface, so runs a little faster. Micro is the next smallest, but will do both surfaces and the V2 and V3 standard flow cells have the same full-size imaging area. Here we can see the specifications for the various types of MySeq flow cells and kit configurations. For run quality, we have two primary specifications, which are Q30 and yield. The exact specifications will depend on the kit type and configuration in use for the run. We can take a brief pause here so everybody can review the tables really quickly, but we're not going to do a deep dive into the various specifications. 
These tables can be found on the MySeq specifications webpage, which there's a link to at the bottom of this slide. Next, we wanted to quickly show the most common MySeq applications, which will include targeted resequencing, small genome sequencing, RNA sequencing, and some other applications such as library QC or FASTQ generation only. Of course, this is not an exhaustive list of all applications which customers use the MySeq instrument for, but instead is more specifically a uh, list of applications which we have supported workflows for at Illumina. The link at the bottom of the slide will take you to the Illumina Local Run Manager support page, where you can confirm the desired application is supported by the software version on your instrument or instruments. If you're unsure of which workflow will work best to help you achieve your goals, we also have the Illumina Kit Selector tool, which again, we've provided the link to in this slide. I personally love this tool, and I used it myself while planning my experiments in graduate school. There are a number of great starting points, such as area of focus, intended applications, methods, what species we intend to study, and potentially the most relevant for many benchtop users, what systems we have available or intend to acquire. The last set of topics I wanted to touch on before we jump into the best practices portion of today's webinar is the common types of control software and their key features. We're going to start off with MySeq Control Software, or MCS 2.6, which is one of the older software versions which is still commonly in use. This is common in facilities running clinical applications where software updates might be less common. This software does require a sample sheet to start a run and lacks options such as manual run setup. With MySeq Control Software 2.6, Sample sheets can be generated from templates or by the Illumina Experiment Manager software. It does have the option to perform automated secondary analysis using MySeq Reporter, but please note that this is different from the Local Run Manager software we'll be discussing today. Unlike Local Run Manager, MySeq Reporter does not facilitate pre-sequencing run planning and sample sheet generation, so it's highly recommended to pair Illumina Experiment Manager for pre-run planning with the MySeq Reporter post-sequencing secondary analysis. Lastly, as shown, MySeq Reporter can be accessed via the web browser at http colon slash slash localhost colon 8042. The next version of software which you're likely to be running or encounter is MySeq Control Software version 3.1. The actual control software interface is basically the same as MCS 2.6, however, there are two major improvements. The first major improvement you'll notice in MySeq Control Software 3.1 are the run setup options. Upon hitting sequence, you'll notice there's three options to start a run. The sample sheet option is functionally the same as starting a run in MCS 2.6. We also will have a manual run setup option, as well as a local run manager option. That brings us to the next major improvement in the software build, which is compatibility with the Illumina Local Run Manager software. As we hinted at in the previous slide, Local Run Manager, or LRM, is a huge improvement over MySeq Reporter. LRM allows us to combine the run planning aspects of Illumina Experiment Manager with user interface improvements and the automated or manual analysis options of MySeq Reporter. There are also some newer analysis apps which are available in Local Run Manager, which are not available in MySeq Reporter. The final software version we'll be discussing today is MySeq Control Software 4.0, which is the newest build and runs on MySeq systems running the latest Windows OS, Windows 10. For older MySeq instruments, this does mean an upgrade from Windows 7 Embedded OS to Windows 10 OS is required, which is a physical hardware upgrade. This upgrade is now available in the Americas region and is covered if your instrument is under an active service contract. You may contact your field team or tech support for additional information and scheduling. If your system is not under an active service contract, 
you may reach out to tech support or your local field representatives for more information or quotes. As with MyC Control Software version 3.1, we maintain three methods of starting a run, but we get the improved performance of LRM v3, which again comes with the latest analysis options and some improved software on the back end to increase data transfer and analysis performance. I wanted to quickly take a second to cover Local Run Manager itself, which as mentioned here is a united framework with modular architecture. So what does that mean? Local Run Manager is a software that is installed on your computer or your instrument computer and runs independently of the control software as well as the RTA primary analysis software. The modular aspect of it means that we're able to download and install various modules into the software, and that allows us for updating specific components without having to update and revalidate the entire software suite. This is great if you want to, say, take a set of data and run it in one module, but then you would like to investigate a different question or a different application with that same data, and you can actually just requeue it through Local Run Manager using that different module here. On the MySeq with MCS version 4, Local Run Manager v3 replaces the MySeq reporter. It's not listed here, but I also wanted to mention that on MySeq Control Software version 3.1, we will be using Local Run Manager v2, which will come into play when you're downloading your analysis modules. v3 modules are not compatible with v2, and vice versa. As mentioned, the three methods of starting a run, which are present in MCS 3.1, are still present in MCS 4.0. The first option we're going to cover is the local run manager option. When selecting this, runs which are planned in the local run manager software will be easily selectable from a list of planned runs, which are displayed in the MySeq control software interface. To view the local run manager interface on the instrument monitor, Open a web browser, which is typically Chromium, and enter HTTPS colon slash slash localhost in the address bar. The appendix of this presentation will also contain a link to relevant resources for Local Run Manager. We also have the sample sheet mode, which is essentially unchanged from MCS 2.6. Lastly, we have the manual mode, which is very helpful if you plan to run your own analysis outside of the Illumina Local Run Manager software, or you encounter issues with run planning or sample sheet generation and just need to get your run going. In this run setup mode, we can simply enter the desired run parameters and go. The output will be .bcl files, which can later be converted to fast queues and analyzed by any desired means. So now that we've covered some general information about the MySeq instrument, let's move on to run best practices, where we're going to cover how to create and start a run, preparing reagent cartridge and libraries, maintenance best practices. We're going to briefly touch on library diversity. We also want to discuss the Illumina Proactive service, as well as cover some basics of sequencing analysis viewer to assess run performance. So starting off our best practices portion here, we wanted to discuss how to prepare your reagents. We have two recommended options to prepare the reagent cartridge. Our first and quickest recommendation is to thaw in a room temp water bath containing enough deionized water to submerge the base of the reagent cartridge. A MySeq V3 cartridge will take roughly 60 to 90 minutes to thaw, whereas the V2 cartridge can thaw effectively in 60 minutes. Allow the reagent cartridge to completely thaw before removing the cartridge from the water bath, gently tapping it on the bench to dislodge excess water from the base of the cartridge. We don't want to insert a ton of water into the instrument. And then dry the base of the cartridge. Our other option, which provides more flexibility and longer reagent stability, is to thaw overnight at 2 to 8 degrees C. Reagents are stable for up to one week when stored at this temperature and using this thawing method. This is really beneficial if you may have a busy schedule and you're unsure if you'll be able to start your run in the next 24 hours or next few hours, and you want to allow yourself the freedom to start that run whenever it's convenient for you.
Next, we'd like to cover how to prepare the reagent cartridge and libraries for sequencing. To prepare the cartridge prior to loading samples, once it's thawed, we will first want to invert the cartridge 10 times to mix the, mix the reagents. While doing so, please inspect the cartridge to ensure all positions appear thawed and we don't have any excess precipitates in the bottom of our reagent wells. If we do notice a small amount of precipitate, we do want to perform some additional inversions to get it to fall back into solution. If we see a large amount of precipitate at the bottom of the reagent well, this is likely going to be a kit that we want to report to tech support since those excess precipitates can be aspirated into the system and cause fluidics issues as well as run performance issues. Assuming everything looks good, we then want to prepare the libraries to be loaded into the reagent cartridge. Libraries must be single stranded to cluster and instructions to prepare your libraries for sequencing can be found in the MySeq Denature and Dilute Libraries Guide, which is linked below. It is highly recommended to add denatured and diluted PhiX control to your libraries. This will create a positive sequencing control. It'll help us gauge loading, and it'll also provide Illumina error rates in the event we have to troubleshoot the run. We'll also want to prepare the sodium hydroxide fresh for each run, and I strongly recommend testing the pH of the sodium hydroxide stock with either a pH meter or pH strips if possible. This will allow us to be confident our denature will proceed as expected. Once denatured, we can load the denatured libraries in the highlighted position on the reagent cartridge by first piercing the foil with a clean pipette tip. We then want to change the tips and aspirate and add our libraries to the well. Please avoid any air bubbles when adding your reagents or your libraries to the reagent cartridge, and then gently tap the cartridge so that libraries pool at the bottom of the well. This will prevent us from aspirating any air into the system when we're applying our library template, and it'll also ensure that we have sufficient volume of our libraries to aspirate instead of, say, having everything stuck on the side of the well, and when we go to aspirate, we won't have sufficient volume. We also advise starting the run within one hour of denaturing the libraries, after which you can perform an additional heat denature if we don't want to re-prepare the libraries. Instructions for that heat denature can be found in the Denature and Dilute Libraries Guide. Moving on to some maintenance best practices now. There are three types of washes on the MySeq system. The post-run wash will take approximately 20 minutes and should be performed as soon as possible after each run. The maintenance wash will take roughly 90 minutes to complete and should be performed at least monthly to maintain the fluidics and prevent reagent buildup in the lines which can cause clogs or performance issues. It is possible to skip this wash for a period However, if it's not performed, the instrument will eventually prevent the user from sequencing until the maintenance wash has been completed. Lastly, I wanted to cover the standby wash, which has been really useful to a lot of customers lately with COVID shutdowns. There are a few stages to this wash, and it takes roughly two hours to complete, but it's really useful when we plan to have the instrument fluidics idle for greater than seven days, and it should be repeated at least monthly while the instrument is idle. To get the instrument out of standby mode, we must perform a maintenance wash, so make sure to build that into your schedule if we do put the instrument into standby wash. I just briefly wanted to touch upon some best practices to increase the chances of success and quality for lower diversity runs. Ideally, we should try to ensure signal from all four bases is present in the first four to seven cycles to best generate the template. Without this, the instrument may have trouble with uh, cluster registration as well as background subtraction. We recommend a minimum of 5% BIX spike-in, though depending on the application, you may need more. There is actually no such thing as too much PhiX as long as we're able to still hit our desired number of reads for each sample so keep that in the back of your mind if you do have doubts about your library diversity. Lastly, reducing the library loading concentration will produce a lower cluster density, which typically aids in a low diversity run. We did include a support bulletin here.
for how much FIAC spike in we recommend with low diversity libraries. And I also recommend checking out a webinar, which I recently presented on, called Considerations for Low Diversity Libraries. I also briefly wanted to discuss Illumina Proactive. The proactive service is free and provides a run performance data, but no sequencing data to Illumina. This will improve your customer experience in two ways. First, Proactive can monitor your run performance metrics to identify and alert tech support to them, so we may proactively assist in identifying the root cause and implementing a resolution. Second, Proactive allows tech support to remotely access the run metrics only. Again, no sequencing data is available to Illumina, only run metrics, which allows us to quickly review issues with you without having to set up a desktop connection or collect the files. This results in up to a 25% faster case resolution time, which means more uptime and more runs for you. It also allows you to access real-time run metrics, historical fleet performance, and comparison tools from your MyIllumina dashboard if you want to remotely monitor your runs without sending them to base space, or you're like me and you really love a lot of data about your instrument performance. Here we have outlined the instructions for activating the Illumina Proactive service. Before doing so, we would strongly recommend providing your IT team with the Illumina Proactive Tech Note linked below to ensure the IT requirements are being met. This will help prevent potential interruptions to runs in progress. If we are not meeting the minimum IT requirements for the Illumina Proactive service, it is possible to have an interruption to your run, and we really want to avoid that at all costs. Once confirmed, we can activate Proactive by selecting the hamburger menu in the top left corner of the MySeq control software homepage as shown here, choose System Settings, and then check the box for Turn on Illumina Proactive Support. Once enabled, your run metrics should automatically be shared with Illumina. Lastly, I wanted to mention Sequencing Analysis Viewer. It's generally considered best practice to verify a run is performed as expected prior to running analysis and is meeting specifications. As mentioned, we have two primary specifications for run performance, which is yield and Q30. These metrics can be easily identified in the Q-score distribution chart of the analysis tab in the top right corner outlined there in red. We've provided a few uh, resources which will help you better understand how to use Sequencing Analysis Viewer and what each one of the metrics means. So the webinar is a great location to start since it will contain a few case studies as well as kind of discuss some common questions and issues. We also have the support bulletin, Does My Sequencing Run Look Good? This is going to cover the common metrics that tech support will even use to diagnose any sort of run performance issues or to assess run performance in general. We also have a web training for the MySeq, which is Does My Run Look Good? This is specific to the MySeq metrics here, and I strongly recommend this one. We also have the Sequencing Analysis Viewer Software Guide. So if you want to go in depth on what each one of these metrics covers and, and what each means, that's a great resource as well. Now that we've discussed some general information about the instrument, as well as some run best practices, let's get into some common troubleshooting. We wanted to break down the common troubleshooting into four sections, which is pre-run issues, issues during pre-run checks, common issues during or after run start, and then a few non-run related issues. Let's start by discussing something which are not necessarily uncommon in MySeq flow cells, which are bubbles inside the flow cell or small scratches on the flow cell surface. Bubbles may be encountered when preparing the flow cell, either when removing it or introduced during cleaning. No troubleshooting is required and the flow cell can be used for the run. Bubbles will be pushed through and fluidics engage during the pre-run checks. And the bubbles generally have no impact on run performance. They won't cause any damage to the oligo lot. Scratched flow cells may also be used for sequencing if the scratches are minor or feather scratches. 
and don't significantly impact the imaging portion of the flow cell. Run performance, as mentioned, is not typically impacted, but if the damage is extensive, tech support is able to replace the flow cell under the consumable warranty. So if you notice anything like large scratches or a crack on the flow cell, you can go ahead and give us a call. Generally with scratched flow cells though, we advise to start troubleshooting by cleaning off the flow cell with ethanol uh, and a dry, uh, or excuse me, we want to clean it with ethanol and then dry with a lint-free lens cleaning tissue as detailed in the MySeq system guide. Please be careful to not introduce ethanol to those gasket ports there on the left side of the flow cell as we don't really want ethanol to get inside the flow cell. We can then run the flow cell and if everything is passing flow check, we can complete the run and evaluate our run performance to assess that everything went as expected. When in doubt, document your damaged or defected flow cell and contact tech support for an assessment. Another issue you may encounter is a failure to read the consumable RFID. MySeq consumables are identified with RFID tags that contain the serial number, lot number, expiration, and reagent version for the reagent cartridge, flow cell, and PR2 bottles. RFID tags that aren't recognized can be bypassed with a bypass code. In rare cases, the RFID reader may require adjustments or service, but this is very rare. Only one component can be bypassed with a bypass code at any one time, so if there are multiple components which cannot be read, we cannot bypass those multiple components. We have some links in this slide which outline the process for generating the RFID bypass codes in detail. That being said, I did want to briefly touch on some of the steps to generate the RFID bypass codes here today. That way you're familiar with what the process looks like when you go to do it yourself. We will start by logging into your My Illumina dashboard, and from the top bar, we can select the More tab which will display the My Tools option. Hover over My Tools, which will then reveal MySeq self-service. Once this option is selected, we can enter the serial number of the instrument and specify what type of bypass code we're looking for. We can then enter this bypass into MySeq control software, after which we will be able to manually enter the reagent ref number, which is the part number, the serial number, and the lot number. The bulletin contains this graphic on the right to outline which number corresponds to which. While rare, I did want to quickly cover the waste bottle full notification on the MySeq system. This error can occur at run setup or mid run. To start, we'll want to ensure the waste bottle is not actually full. And if the bottle is full, it can be removed emptied, replaced, and either the pre-run check started again or the run resumed. If the bottle is empty and the error is given inaccurately, this can be due to sensor communications, the sensor being dirty, or the sensor not working properly. The sensor is a little black bulb structure that can be seen at the top of the sipper into the waste bottle. To see it clearly, lift the sipper from the waste bottle and remove the bottle. Wipe down the sensor with a Kim wipe damp with deionized water, dry it, and then resume the run. If the error persists after cleaning the sensor, we may power cycle the instrument to reset the sensor communications with the instrument. And if this does not work or resolve the issue, please reach out to tech support for additional assistance. While setting up a run, we may encounter a disk space error during the pre-run check. This occurs when the instrument is ensuring there is sufficient local disk space to accommodate the desired run. It's most often related to runs needing to be cleared from the instrument, which can be performed through manage files as shown here. Instructions for how to do so can also be found in the system guide. If the error persists after clearing these files, we may have files stacking up elsewhere on the instrument hard drive, especially if we've been saving our runs locally. 
inspect the disk space in File Explorer, and we can also empty the recycle bin as the best places to start. If you're unable to figure out where data is stacking up on your local drives, please reach out to tech support and we'd be happy to assist you further by looking in the common locations and even setting up a desktop connection to assist you in your search. Assuming we're sending our run to a network location, the system will check that the network connection is active. If we see the checks fail, the network connection active test, we should first confirm the ethernet cable is connected. We want to make sure it's connected at both the back of the instrument and the wall. If the ethernet is connected, please attempt to reboot the control software first. Should the issue persist after restarting our software, we can then attempt a full power cycle to reset the networking interfaces on the instrument. If at this point the check is still not passing, we should attempt to use a new ethernet cable. Cables do sometimes go bad for no apparent reason, so it's really always worth a try. Lastly, if it's still not working at this point, we typically advise you to work with your IT to confirm the server is up before reaching out to tech support for additional assistance. Another pre-run check issue we may encounter is the primary analysis ready test. This error occurs when the primary analysis performed by RTA from the previous run has not completed yet. The options are we can wait one hour and see if the analysis is able to complete. If after one hour the analysis is not completed, you can choose to terminate the analysis but that note that this option will be available you know, at any point. We just usually want to give it an extra hour to try to complete. Please note that this will result in no additional BCL data being generated for the run, which is still being analyzed, and is effectively you know, canceling the run and canceling the data generation process. If the analysis is stalled and we'd like tech support assistance, or the error persists after terminating the analysis, please go ahead and give us a call here in tech support and we'd be happy to assist further. Another error which is not uncommon is the unable to measure flow rate errors on the MySeq. This one is actually very common and makes up a lot of our calls here in tech support. So we do have a very detailed support bulletin for this topic, which is linked to in this slide. To start, we want to inspect the flow cell to ensure the gaskets are not warped or damaged and are sitting flush with the flow cell. If flow cell defects are identified, such as raised, warped, or otherwise damaged gaskets, please reach out to tech support immediately. If everything looks good, we can clean and reseat the flow cell, and we also want to clean the stage off to ensure it's seated properly before attempting flow rate again. If this does not resolve the issue, Please attempt to power cycle the instrument in case the issue is a result of a communications error between the pumps and or sensors. If the flow check is still failing at this point, we can attempt to use a different flow cell from a new kit if possible. If at this point the issue is still persisting, please reach out to tech support immediately. We also advise that you retain the flow cell storage buffer for every flow cell so in the event we get to this point and we start to suspect a hardware issue, the flow, cell buffs, excuse me, the flow cells can be returned to buffer and stored for later use. Alternatively, flow cells can be returned to their tube and immersed in PR2 buffer if we've already discarded the storage buffer. Next, we wanted to move on to some of the most common cycle one errors on the MySeq. Potential errors include best focus not found, best focus too near edge of range, no usable signal found, it's possible clustering has failed, through focus peak did not exceed SNR threshold, Z motor attempt to move outside of soft limits, and through focus scan, course focus failed to find focus, and there is no fallback position. Please note that this last error is specific to MCS 4.0, so it should only be on our Windows 10 instruments. 
The support bulletin linked here will outline detailed steps for how to begin addressing this issue. And I'd also recommend to reach out to tech support to at the very least document the case and in the event you'd like additional troubleshooting assistance. Some possible instrumentation causes of these errors include poor delivery of reagents involved in cluster generation or first base chemistry such as sequencing primers, flow cell temperature control issues, optical system issues, although these are very rare. Possible library and reagent causes of cycle one errors are the use of expired or improperly stored reagents, library design and or quality or quantification issues. So if we have you know, an incompatible library or either too much or too little library in our pool, we can get this error. Poor read one primer to hybridization due to library design issues. We can also see poor read one primer hybridization as a result of incompatible primers if we're using custom primers. And lastly, under or over clustering, which can cause difficulty with cluster registration and background subtraction. If we have too many clusters on the flow cell, we may not be able to properly identify the background and it causes issues with the flow cell being able to, to distinguish individual clusters. And under clustering may not provide enough signal for the instrument to properly focus. There are some general steps we can take to begin troubleshooting of cycle one errors on the MySeq. We typically want to start by performing the post-run wash as prompted by the instrument to maintain our instrument fluidics. We can then power cycle the instrument as described in the system guide, after which go to manage instrument and select system checks. We can run the system checks using the flow cell from the failed run, which will help diagnose any potential consumables issues. We want to select all motion tests, prime reagent lines, and both thermal ramping and volume test. If the volume test fails, any position other than PR2 or any of the other tests fail, go ahead and reach out to us here in tech support for further assistance. Should we see a failure during that system check, please power cycle the instrument, load a previously successful flow cell, perform a maintenance wash to hydrate that flow cell as well as clear out any obstructions in the fluidics lines, and set up another set of system checks on the instrument. This may allow us to determine if the original failure is due to the flow cell or a communications issue. In the event the second system check fails, go ahead and definitely reach out to tech support so we can document the issue and investigate further. The Field Programmable Gate Array Board, or FPGA Board, is responsible for a number of tasks on the instrument, and therefore, there's a number of errors that can arise from it. One of the more common errors which arise from the FPGA board is the FPGA reported an error while executing command zip down. This is pretty much what it sounds like. The instrument is having a hard time dropping the instrument zippers. To begin troubleshooting, we can start by power cycling the instrument. Once reinitialized, we'll want to re inspect the reagent cartridge to verify there's no evidence of damage, such as scouring or scratching. We also want to ensure the cartridge was fully thawed and the cartridge was pushed back into the instrument. It's also worth noting if the foils are pierced or not for your reagent position. If everything looks good, go ahead and perform the post-run wash to assess the function of the instrument fluidics and make sure the zippers themselves are not damaged. If there's no indication of damage to the instrument during, and the wash completes as normal, you may set up the run with the same set of consumables. As mentioned previously, there are many possible errors which can arise from the FPGA board, and we've listed a number of these errors here. While many may seem similar, these are all distinct issues. That being said, there are some common troubleshooting steps which are similar to the previously reviewed steps. We're going to want to power cycle the instrument and verify a successful reinitialization to address any possible communications issues between the FPGA board and the instrument component. We can then go ahead and set up the post run wash. And if everything completes as normal, you may set up the next run. If your error which caused the failure 
occurred immediately after run start within one to two minutes. We generally advise attempting to set up with the same set of consumables since they may have not been marked as used. We, otherwise, we'd prepare new consumables to not waste a, a whole bunch of time setting up runs a few times and then getting a, a used reagent error here. Another error which can arise from the FPGA board but has several other distinct causes is the Z motor error. While trying to find focus, the Z stage has attempted to move outside ex its acceptable range is the common error. And this error can be a result of communications issues, issues detecting or focusing on the clusters as a result of fluidics, library or chemistry issues, and sometimes hardware issues. To start troubleshooting, we'd advise going ahead and, oh, excuse me there. To start troubleshooting, we'd advise investigating the thumbnail images to confirm if there's some issue with the clusters or focusing. So we'll want to investigate if our images appear clean and in focus, if our clusters are moving from image to image, which would be investigating for what's known as stale images or noting that our clusters appear washed out or there's no real differentiation between cluster intensity, which appears fluorescing and what might be background. We also want to inspect our reagents to make sure that they're within expiration. We also want to confirm our library design is compatible with the Illumina platforms and that our library QC was accurate. It's also worth noting that if we're using custom primers, are these primers compatible expired, in good shape, were they added to the proper well, and did we select the correct parameters in case we're spiking them into Illumina custom primer wells, or just, or excuse me, spiking them into Illumina primer wells, or just adding them to the regular custom primer wells. To assess a hardware issue, we can perform a power cycle and run the system check on the instrument. If the system check is passing, we should be good to set up the next run. Now that we've talked about some run setup and run performance related issues, let's talk about some non-run issues. To start, let's talk about it, washes taking an extended time to complete. The quick wash should take roughly 20 to 30 minutes. If we're using the template line wash, that's the 30 minute wash. Manual or maintenance washes take about 90 minutes and a standby wash takes roughly two hours. To start troubleshooting, we want to confirm what wash was intended to start and how long ago it was started to confirm that we are in fact seeing a prolonged wash time. If we see this or we see that the wash notification on the bottom kind of repeats, maybe it's saying, you know, wash two of two for a very long time during a manual or maintenance wash, that can also provide evidence the wash has stalled. In these cases, you can exit the wash power cycle the MySeq instrument to reset all communications, and then repeat the wash that was in progress and monitor for the time to complete. If we see the wash complete as normal, that would indicate it's a communications issue and we're good to go ahead and return the instrument to service. If we find that the issue is persisting and we're unable to complete the wash, go ahead and reach out to tech support and we'd be happy to investigate further for you. Two common errors on the MySeq running MySeq control software version 4.0 on Windows 10 are, cannot initiate communication with universal copy service, make sure that the service is installed and started, or the following service, or the following required software is either not installed or not running, sequencing cannot be performed until this problem is fixed, contact Illumina tech support, universal copy service. These errors are common after updating the SBS admin and SBS user Windows credentials, which is required every 180 days by default by Windows 10. Please note that if we're prompted to change one, we should probably confirm that the other is needing to be changed and is updated since that will be required for proper instrument use. When the Windows user credentials are changed, the local run manager and universal copy services can no longer log on successfully to launch. To resolve the error, 
we'll want to log in to Local Run Manager using an admin account. And from the Local Run Manager dashboard navigation bar, select Menu, and then select Tools, and then System Settings. You can then select the Services Accounts tab, where you will see two options, and you want to select Windows Account. You can then enter your username here, generally SBS user, that we plan to run out of, and then enter your updated Windows password. Select Save, and it should give you a spinning wheel, and then indicate that the credentials were updated successfully, after which we should be able to resume normal use of the instrument. If we do get an error, please go ahead and contact tech support as we can assist with manually updating these service credentials. We've also provided some support bulletins here at the bottom of the slide, which will outline those manual update steps, as well as the steps that we just covered here today to go ahead and update your service credentials. Should we encounter any issues during the run demultiplexing, also called DMUX, we can use a file which is output during fast queue generation called the demultiplex summary F1L1. I'm going to stop here for a minute and just to let you guys know, I love this file. This is a great file for any sort of demultiplexing issues we might run into. The file is broken down into two sections. The first section being the number of reads identified per tile per sample. Samples, as outlined in green there, are listed along the top, and we have our flow cell tiles along the left side. That table will then contain the percentage of reads demultiplexed per sample per tile, which is also really useful if you want to kind of determine, you know, a spatial analysis on the flow cell. Section two is even more useful since it's going to list the most commonly detected index pairs, which were not included in the sample sheet. So if we did create our sample sheet and our indexes were not in the proper orientation, or maybe we pooled the wrong samples out of our plate, it'll be easily identifiable from section two of this DMUX summary F1L1. It will also show the number of reads which correspond to these sequences, which is super helpful in identifying if maybe there was an issue um, at a single base in one of your index sequences that might be throwing you off so you can, of course, you know, uh, make any needed changes to your sample sheet if your sequencing data looks good and you want to, you know, get those extra reads demultiplexed to a given sample. Our last topic for today is how to requeue analysis or generate fast queues from an incomplete run in Local Run Manager. I'm not going to go into the exact steps here since there's a ton of variables. However, the links below will contain very detailed instructions for how to do so. While not provided in this slide, the link support bulletins themselves will also contain links to how to, uh, for how to do nearly the exact same thing in base space if that's where we prefer to do our demultiplexing. Now that we've bombarded you with a ton of information, I want to begin wrapping up by covering some resources which we provided links to here in our appendix. At the top, we have a link to the MySeq support page. That is a hyperlink there, so you can click on it and be taken directly to that web page. We also have a hyperlink to the MySeq system documentation page, where you can find some of those below resources, such as the system guide for local run manager, system guide for MySeq reporter, so that would be MCS 2.6, MySeq system safety and compliance guide, as well as the site prep guide. We also have some supporting documents here, such as the MySeq output and analysis folders, if you want to familiarize yourself with folder structure, the custom primers guide, which I highly recommend reviewing if we do plan to use any custom primers or our lab is using custom primers, the security best practices guide, which definitely should be reviewed by your IT and networking professionals, you know, and if you want to uh, have your text review it as well, that's never a bad idea. We also have understanding Illumina quality scores, which will explain how FRED scoring and Q30 work. We also have the optimizing cluster density on Illumina sequencing systems link here, and this is super valuable if we do have issues with 
achieving a reliable cluster density or start seeing a lot of no usable signal errors or best focus errors. I have a link here to the recorded webinars and trainings page, which contains a ton of relevant classes and information, as well as the MySeq support bulletins page. We've also listed a bunch of resources here for the MySeq or resources which are relevant to runs performed on the MySeq here. Please note they might not all seem MySeq specific, but I can guarantee you they will have information that you'll find valuable if you're running the instrument regularly. We also have some online courses. Here we've listed a few relevant ones for the MySeq, such as preparing for your install if you're getting a new instrument, how to start your run, which will cover the newest software version, MCS 4.0, MySeq covering MySeq Reporter and how to use that, does my run look good, which we mentioned during our webinar here, and imaging and base calling, which is super helpful to understand the four color chemistry in the MySeq which might be different from other systems you're familiar with from Illumina. We also have some expert video tips linked here on our YouTube page, as well as on our website. So this includes is my HiSeq or MySeq run over clustered, optimizing Amplicon sequencing, so that's gonna be for low diversity, how to achieve consistent quantification, which is re really a great one, again, if we're encountering best focus errors or low intensity, uh, and how to tell if I sequence through the insert, which is really, really useful if we get some sort of best focus errors at the end of our runs, we're seeing drops in quality or upticks in various base calls. Lastly, let's talk about some proactive resources on the Illumina website. So of course we have linked the Illumina proactive website itself. We also have the overviews and benefits of Illumina proactive service. So there's the data security overview for data security here. It outlines what we're gonna get, which of course is just sequencing metrics and no sequencing data, no fast user BCL. The FAQ for proactive, my Illumina overview, as well as the Illumina privacy and security statement. We also have the data security technical note and some videos for how to go ahead and activate and use your Illumina proactive. For additional assistance, please go ahead and contact us at the link below or feel free to call in anytime. 